welcome everybody to the soil care um, soil carbon workshop with Love and Broken CMA presenting today. Uh, for those that aren't presenting, John and Anne, can you turn your videos off, please? It helps with our presentation screen screening. Thanks, John. Um, so my name's Karen Brisbane Bullock, and I'm from the Golden Broken CMA. And on behalf of the Commonwealth Government National Land Care Program, we're presenting this workshop, uh, free workshop. We've got uh, Jim Radford with us from La Trobe University, who is a research fellow from uh, the Research Centre for Future Landscapes. We've got Cassandra Schaaf, a soil scientist, also a research coordinator for River Plains. And then we've got uh, Cassandra, who's not currently on board, but uh, I mean not Cassandra, Jen Woods, she's at Trobe University, uh, microbiologist, uh, micro, sorry, microecologist. And Eamon Reeves will be doing our administration today. Um, thanks, Eamon, and he'll be admitting you and so forth. So we've got 103 attendees uh, so far um, that have registered. So we are just mindful that we'll be recording today's session, and this will be available on the GBCMA website in a few days' time. So if you do have questions or you do say something, just be mindful that it will be recorded. To ask questions, we're going to be using the chat box, which is the square box that looks like a talking box, uh, third from the right bottom of the screen. Uh, and once the presenter has finished, we will then go to the questions for those presenters. So the agenda so far is that Cass will present for the first 50 minutes talking about soil carbon 101 basically. And then we'll do some questions, 10 minutes of questions. And then Jim Radford will talk about the Trobe University project and he'll talk for 20 minutes and we'll have 10 minutes questions time after that and more if we need to. For those that have just joined us, please put your uh, videos off, please. So Ron Harris, Anne, can you take your videos off for us, please? Thank you. And Cass can be the sole presenter for us. And I will leave it in Cassandra's hands. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks very much, Karen. All right, let's do our first test of technology to make sure that uh, it's all working. All right, now can you see this, see my presentation? Yes, we can, Cass. Awesome. Okay, so this is a bit of a new experience to, to be talking to a screen of, of letters, but um, hopefully we'll stay with me and we'll see how we go. So thanks, Karen, for inviting me to be part of this today. It's great that there's so much interest in soil carbon and uh, how we can use it to better support our agricultural environments and our general ecosystems in general. So as Karen mentioned, I'm going to give a brief overview today, well, a, an overview today of soil carbon and how it works in our landscapes. And then uh, Jim will follow up with, a, with an example of some work that's been done in this space. Okay, so as mentioned, I'll be talking about what soil organic carbon and soil organic matter is. I'll be talking about how it's measured, what it can do for you, uh, things like climate change and well, climate and carbon. Um, talking about some wine barrels, always good in this part of the world. Uh, how do you grow carbon and then how you can lose it? So when we talk about soil organic matter, we talk about soil carbon, we tend to talk about the two terms very interchangeably, which means that there can be a bit of confusion about what we're talking about. So if we look at what we consider to be organic matter in soil, when we look at it, um, what's it, what's it made of? What it's made of is it's made of carbon, but it's also made of nitrogen and hydrogen and phosphorus and sulfur and a heap of other nutrients as well. So that organic matter as such is a very complex uh, matrix containing a lot of different materials of different structures. But the key thing that I'd like to, to you to take away from today is the different nutrients in that that are involved in carbon as well, which is very important in sustaining it. 
So mentioned when we talk about soil organic matter in its broader sense, this encompasses all the organic materials found in soils, regardless of their origin or their state of decomposition. So organic matter is a very broad, all encompassing term that unfortunately means very different things to different people. But what's really important is when we look at these nutrients in soil, what we've found is that the nutrients and their interaction with carbon in soil organic matter is very consistent. And it's not just inconsistent in our region or, or in Australia, the ratios or the relationships with carbon to other nutrients is quite stable all across the world. So that's telling us that soil organic matter to be requires these nutrients to be present in at least um, suitable ratios. So we tend to talk a bit about carbon to nitrogen ratios. And we talk about that in terms of in soil, we talk about that in terms of organic amendments and how different materials interact with soil. Um, so we, soil organic matter has a C to N ratio of about 10 to 1. Carbon to sulfur, about 54 to 1. So that's about 54 units of carbon for every unit of sulfur. That's and carbon to phosphorus, we talk about 155 to 1. So I'll put those up as examples. There's ratios with the other nutrients as well. The key thing, the primary thing to, th to think about is that carbon to nitrogen ratio of 10 to 1. And that'll become more important as we'll talk through this presentation. So just to define another term that's used very loosely um, in society, and it's the term humus. So historically, humus used to be very much considered to be equitable to soil organic matter uh, or anything that was kind of dark and earthy and had that kind of biological smell. As part of the, the work that's been done over the last 15 years around identifying um, and how we can support soil carbon and soil, we've had to come up with some really strong definitions of what all these things mean. So in this sense, we talk about humus as the very fine fraction of soil organic matter, which passes through a 53 micron sieve. So that's incredibly small. That's, that's 0.5 millimetres in diameter. And these, this humus is mostly bound to clay minerals. So when we talk about carbon that's captured in soil for sequestration and long-term accrual, this humus fraction is very important because it's very stable because of its chemical interaction with soil. <clears throat> so that's just a bit of a, a starting point. So we talk about organic matter and why it's so important, but why is there so much emphasis on carbon in soil rather than talking about soil organic matter as a whole? The answer for that is very simple. It's because we can measure it. What we measure when we measure carbon in soil is we either measure total carbon, which is measured by either what we call leco carbon analysis or loss on ignition, or we talk about organic carbon, which is with a method that historically has been the Walkley Black. Those two tests tell you is the total amount of carbon in soil, um, and we talk about our total carbon analysis, but that includes charcoals and carbonates as well, so inorganic forms of carbon. When we talk about our organic carbon fraction, that's mostly derived from the amount of carbon in soil that's due to biological function. So the key things to think about is that there are no accredited laboratories in Australia that measure soil organic matter. All the tests are done on soil organic carbon. But then when we think about some of the soil tests that we've got, um, we tend to find that the labs will report on soil organic matter. But what that is, is they measure soil organic carbon, and then based on these stable ratios of carbon to other nutrients, they've come up with a multiplication factor of 1.72. When they add that to the soil organic carbon number, that gives them an estimate of soil organic matter. But the trick with this though, is that 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 analysis or that measure of soil organic carbon can change according to the or soil organic matter. That ratio can vary from 1.72 to 2, depending on the origin and the nature of that soil organic matter. So when you're getting your soil test done, 
it's really important to look at that soil organic carbon number because that's the number that has greater consistency and that's the number that you're looking to track over time. <clears throat> when we talk about our sampling and analysis for soil carbon, and this is really important because the numbers are then what drive your decision making and that's what drives your changes in management practice on farm. So it's really important to get this right. So the key is to use standard soil sampling measurement techniques. And we'll talk a bit more again about this later. Use a NATA accredited laboratory, also preferably one that's ASPAC accredited. So NATA accreditation is, is means that that lab adheres to um, very standard protocols <coughs> and reproducibility. The ASPAC accreditation is is for the Australian Soil and Plant Analysis Council. And this is a group that determine the variance in results between laboratories and aim to reduce that variance so that different laboratories are reporting on very um, similar numbers, which increases the robustness of that whole analytical system. So this is important. There's a lot of glossy brochures out there and there's laboratories which seem like they've got the goods, but the key is if they're not prepared to um, commit to this accreditation, then they're not providing the, the confidence to you as a user that the data that's been generated from that is, is robust. So that's something to think about. As part of that, using the same laboratory every year or every time you do your sampling, every year or every five years, if you use the same laboratory, you're cutting down on that potential variance between the numbers that you're getting. The next thing to think about is sampling at the same time every year. This is an example using uh, pH in water that was where a lot of different samples in different soil types were taken over the year, which demonstrates the amount of flux that can happen with our results. pH in, in water is particularly sensitive to seasonal variability, which is why we tend to use the pH and calcium chloride methodologies. But this demonstrates that if you're changing your, um, your timing of something through the year, there's potential for the um, for the numbers that you're generating also changing. <clears throat> There's a lot of interest in sampling for, for microbial communities and there are some laboratories that offer that service. The key to, to think about is, is soil analyses for, for microbes are generally subject to high variability in time and space. So if you um, using the, the techniques that are available within our commercial labs, um, where they're just where they're picking up what's there at that point in time, that can change very quickly according to soil moisture and temperature and other seasonal conditions. So if you're interested in looking at the microbes in your system, that's that's fantastic. But don't use that if if you're if you're analysing and getting the results for that, don't use that those results as your primary data set for making decisions, okay? Use them as a supporting data set, which then your soil chemical analysis then provides the, the guts to then make sure that you're making appropriate decisions on farm. So this sampling is generally around <coughs> soil organic carbon in our systems. If we're sampling for soil carbon stocks or sequestration with the aim of achieving carbon credits, there's certain protocols that are required for this and they can be quite strict and detailed. And so that's a whole different kettle of fish that you'd have to, to delve into if that's a, an approach that you'd like to take. So before we go further, just thought it's chance just to do a term check. Um, there's a word that we use a lot in soil science called mineralization. And particularly when we talk about soil organic matter and soil carbon, we talk about mineralization of carbon and mineralization of nitrogen. Um, again, it's a term that's used sometimes a bit loosely, but it's worth just checking in to make sure that we're all on the same page. So when we talk about mineralization of carbon in soils, we're talking about the conversion of complex carbon structures such as lignin and polysaccharides that may be part of that organic matter matrix, and the conversion of that into carbon dioxide through these microbial processes, so CO2. So as microbes consume organic matter and convert it into more, more um, 
uh, simpler systems, then um, just like us, they breathe in oxygen and they breathe out CO2, which means that they can, as that those organic matter is broken down, a more and more of that is eventually converted into carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So the other term is mineralization of nitrogen. And this is the conversion of complex nitrogen structures, such as proteins and amides, to ammonium and then to nitrate. So nitrate um, being the plant available form of nitrogen that the plants take up. So we're not, the difference is we're not losing this from the system, but we are converting it or mineralizing, so taking away and simplifying the system um, down to, some, to a very simple molecule called nitrate. So key is same term, different endpoints. The mineralization of carbon eventually results in the loss of carbon from that system in CO2. Mineralization of nitri nitrogen converts organically bound nitrogen into plant available nitrogen. Okay, so what can carbon do for you in your systems? There's, if we didn't think it was of value, you wouldn't be here today and you wouldn't be interested in, in learning more about it. So we know that there's a lot of benefits from having carbon in our systems. You know, there's physical benefits in terms of improved soil structure, infiltration and, and associated water storage, reduced soil strength. We know there's significant chemical benefits. Soil organic matter has its own cation exchange capacity, which as you build up soil organic matter in your soils, you're then contributing to increasing this, the cation exchange capacity of your soil, which improves its uh, nutrient um, nutrient holding capacity, its water holding capacity, its ability to interact chemically with the soil around it and provide additional benefit. Um, increasing soil carbon also can increase um, by default the, the nutrients in your system through um, supporting those nutrients in soil organic matter and it can also um, improve the release of nutrients that have been chemically bound onto soil surfaces. And obviously um, in terms of chemically the addition of soil organic matter and carbon then by default increases our carbon level in soil which then um, by itself also helps in terms of a lot of exchange. We know there's a lot of biological benefits and I'm sure um, Jim will touch on this later. Um, soil organic matter provides uh, food, energy and habitat to microbes and other soil organisms. It acts as an osmocote uh, type of thing in that the nutrients that are within soil organic matter aren't static and so with time they will convert uh, convert through and so result in a slow release of nutrients back to the soil and, and back to the plant. Improved soil organic matter and soil carbon in soil can also <coughs> may increase the amount of beneficial microbes can, uh, versus the pathogenic microbes in the system which comes back to having a, a healthier soil, a more um, diverse microbial community and um, something that's functioning well at, at the chemistry level. And just some just some cool pictures um, when we look at particulate carbon, so that which is on its way to being broken down into stable carbon. Um, we can see what these structures look like at a, um, at a micro scale level, which is which is always amazing. <coughs> And then when we look at our nutrients in soil um, and our carbon, I've just chosen phosphorus as an example, but it's the same with every other nutrient as well. They're not spatially um, homogeneous through the soil. And even at that sub micron level, they're still um, quite heterogeneous in how they're dispersed. So just to touch briefly on climate and soil carbon, as there has been over the past few years, a lot of emphasis on using soil organic matter and soil carbon to sequester carbon from the atmosphere and reduce atmospheric CO2 levels, which is, um, this is something that's not new. So I'd just like to just snapshot that system, just to explain how that works and what the reality of that system looks like. So the key element of carbon sequestration in soil is the capture of atmospheric CO2 into plants through photosynthesis, which uses light energy to convert that CO2 into carbohydrates in the plant leaves. So photosynthesis isn't, isn't new. It's, um, 
it didn't arrive with the carbon sequestration, sorry. Obviously, it's how plants do their thing. So that's the key element which captures that CO2 from the atmosphere and pulls it and will eventually pull it into the soil. Once that plant material dies, then microbes will break it down into soil organic matter. When those microbes die, they're then decomposed by other microbes and that in essence is building those stores of soil organic matter and carbon in our soils. So if there is a net accumulation of carbon through this process, then we can say that carbon from the atmosphere is captured and is sequestered into soil. If, and this is something that doesn't attract as much attention as I think it deserves. The key element of this is that just like us, microbes breathe in oxygen and they breathe out CO2, carbon dioxide. They also breathe out nitrous oxide and other greenhouse gases. So it's not a perfect process. Most of the carbon that's captured in plants through photosynthesis will eventually find its way back to the atmosphere through CO2. So just to consider that this isn't something that is a, is a given, it's something you have to work for. Key part of this is that not all plant matter is considered equal. So plant organic materials contain sugars, amino acids, proteins, cellulose, hemicellulose, fat starches and waxes, and lignans and tannins. And as you go down that list, they increase in their complexity of structure and their resistance to decomposition. That means that the microbes have to work harder to break them down. They also require different microbial groups to decompose them. So a lot of the simple materials are broken down by bacteria, whereas fungi tend to um, have more dominance when it comes to the hemicelluloses and lignans and tannins. So this structure on the side here is a structure, an example structure of lignin, and it's just demonstrating how complex and strong that structure is and how for microbes to break those bonds and break down that carbon is a really big deal. Key thing that we need to think about if we're asking microbes to break down reasonably complex, strong structures is that they need adequate nutrition. They need nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and all the other nutrients. <clears throat> as a kind of, as such hard work, it's like a nutrient diet, it's like protein shakes. So the more complex carbon in the system, for example, um, wheat stubble, for example, has a carbon to nitrogen ratio of about 100 to one. <clears throat> So the carbon in that wheat stubble is really hard to decompose. So the microbes have to work really hard to make that work. And as such, it can be quite inefficient. And increased, so decreased efficiency in microbial conversion increases the amount of CO2 respired. So it's, um, so I hope that makes sense that um, the more we, the more, the range of, materials we ask microbes to break down, the more they need to be supported in their nutrient balance. So a good way to think about soil carbon accrual and accumulation in soil is that it's, it's, a, it's a managed process. And this is something that I'll keep coming back to. It's not something that will just happen. Um, it's something we actually have to pay attention to. So when we so I like to, to use the analogy of the, wine, of the leaky wine barrel um, when we talk about our most limiting factors. And um, if we think about the law of the minimum, it's that barrel can never reach the top until all the different elements or all the different um, holes in that barrel have been fixed. And so everything's at the top. As long as there's a leaky part there somewhere or a broken rib, then that's what's going to be the most limiting factor for your ability to build soil organic matter. And that's what will determine if you lose carbon, if you maintain what you've got, or if you're able to build. So we'll just very quickly go through these because we'll come back to them again in a minute. Um, so obviously water is very important. In a, in a hot, dry summer uh, with, no, with no rain, 
uh, microbes are going to uh, reduce their activity and they're going to reduce their carbon uh, consumption and there may actually be increased loss of carbon in our hot systems. So obviously water is important. Temperature and humidity is important. Through the, uh, the SCARP program, the Soil Carbon in Agriculture Research Program, which was a national um, program done a few years ago, there was a, a lot of soil sampling done around the country and a lot of identification of what were the key um, drivers or what were the key relationships between carbon and other factors. If we look at across regions, even in Victoria, um, the key driving factor, or the key most relatable parameter connecting car with carbon was actually a climate and temperature, rainfall and humidity. So if you look at across regions, that's a key driver. If you look at between regions, it's less important. We can focus more on management, but just demonstrating that that's one of the, the key issues. Soil pH uh, is something that I talk a lot about. Um, it is the, I think in our systems, it is the key um, that's limiting a lot of our soil carbon accrual. There's a perception that microbes can adjust soil carbon and uh, remove the need for liming. Unfortunately, this isn't true. We do know that different microbes have a range of pH values in which they are comfortable and in which they will um, do their job well. If we look at the range of values, um, there's some fungi that can go right down to pH of two, but they're not always the fungi that you want in your systems. So a pH, if just looking at what the bacteria and other microbes need to do well, at least a pH of, of, um, of five, uh, five more, and this would be in calcium chloride, is required to get that optimum pH values. And unfortunately, a lot of the pHs in our system are down to, are down to low fours and even in high threes. So the key is in, in highly acidic systems, microbes don't function well they barely function at all. You're not getting any of the benefits from microbes that you should be getting. So a key example of a benefit from microbes is the rhizobium, uh, which is the bacteria that symbiotically inoculate and um, connect with legumes. I'll give an example here of sub, sub clover. So, in, so rhizobia don't like pHs below 5.5 in calchloride, which means that they're not going to be functioning in those systems. So what we can see is that in areas where we've been, we've got well nodulated uh, sub clover because our pHs and everything is suitable, getting a lot more um, biomass, but we're also getting a lot more root growth, which is also important. When our pHs are too low and we're not getting that inoculation and functioning of rhizobia in our systems, we're getting very poor plant growth and very poor root growth. So this is something that just can't be emphasised enough, that soil pH, low soil pHs will basically shut down your ability to build soil carbon. So nutrients, as you've guessed, that's something I also think is pretty important. So we know that soil organic matter has this consistent ratio of nutrients. So an imbalance in those nutrients, such as lack of nitrogen in our systems, will result in more carbon lost as carbon dioxide. So increased, so decreased nutrient availability means decreased efficiency of microbial processes, which means decreased ability to build soil organic matter. So the key to remember is that nutrients out in agricultural produce must be balanced with nutrients in to avoid decline in both our nutrient status, our plant growth, and our soil organic matter. So again, there's a perception that microbes can create nutrients in soil. Microbes can access um, pools of nutrients in soil that plants can't. And so by doing so and releasing enzymes, such as phosphatase enzymes, they can release previously non-available phosphorus into make it available for plant use which is awesome, but you're still only dealing with the pool of phosphorus that you've got in the soil. 
So the only nutrient that microbes can create, basically from thin air, is plant available nitrogen through the um, end fixing bacteria, such as rhizobia and free living uh, end fixes, uh, being able to function well under suitable pHs and suitable nutrition. That is the only way that, that microbes can pull in an, a, a nutrient into soil basically for free, because it's not for free because you have to invest in getting everything else right. Soil type is something we'll briefly touch on again in a minute, um, but just flagging that that is a key driver of soil, soil carbon um, accumulation and soil, soil organic matter building up in soil. And so it's something that needs to be considered when you're targeting your expectations around what kinds of and levels of soil organic matter that you can achieve. Time obviously is important um, in these systems Anything that happens quickly is unlikely to be stable over the long term. So if you're expecting a quick fix or you measure a quick fix, it's unlikely that that will actually continue to still be there and be stable in years to come. It's this, it's this reasonably slow, consistent approach that will create these stable, um, uh, resilient forms of soil organic matter in your systems. Climate um, obviously comes in a lot with um, what we've talked about before, um, with humidity, temperature and rainfall. So again, in different climatic systems, we have different um, potential to build soil carbon. So as I keep saying, and I'll keep saying again through the presentation, just like growing crops or grass, growing carbon in our systems requires management and it requires inputs. So, funny should ask, how would we go about managing growing our soil carbon? Key elements to consider are the, the things that we, we've talked about in the last 10 minutes. <clears throat> so we talk about water. So good ground cover, good plant cover of the soil will incredibly assist in moving in, in catching water uh, when it rains and moving that into the soil. It will also um, ensure that you've got that kind of humid layer on the soil surface. Good water infiltration, uh, that will provide both plants and microbes with the best possible moisture conditions. So every drop of rain that falls um, is captured and used in that system. Again, as I keep saying, nutrients, um, as Per the ratios of soil organic matter, to build carbon requires inputs of other nutrients. So I, I mentioned this before, but all plant and animal exports, so all food and fibre that we create on farm, removes nutrients from the system. Okay, so every cow that, that heads to the abattoirs, every bale of hay, every um, box of cherries, every, every bale of wool, everything that moves off your farm takes nutrients with it. Which sounds a bit weird until you consider, um, okay, what's a cow, what's an animal made of? What's a cow made of? Um, we know the meat that a cow, obviously the muscle and, and fat, the, the muscle contains a lot of protein. Proteins are made up of nitrogen and, and sulfur and, and other nutrients. We know that bones, are made up predominantly of calcium phosphate. So we're taking, we're exporting phosphorus from our soil. We're also exporting calcium, which contributes to our decline in, in soil pH. So it doesn't matter what you're doing on farm, if you're creating something to eat or wear or use, you're going to remove nutrients. So low input systems or um, farms that are run with low inputs um, as a as a, a choice or you know because of necessity whichever for whichever reason it is but if you're running a low input so you're not matching the mass balance of nutrients that are leaving your farm you're mining your soil reserves so even though you might be saying that we're using the soil to to capture our nutrients those nutrients 
come from a defined discrete bucket of soil. And once those nutrients are gone, if you don't replace them, then you're resulting in long-term depletion and degradation of the soil. So that's really important. So if, if you're saying, oh, we, um, if, if the consideration is to use microbes to access the nutrients, um, yeah, they're still just pulling from, from what's there. And the trick is with plants is that they're incredibly efficient at scavenging. So even if you're, if you're growing plants and you're going for a low input system, and so you're, for example, you're only providing, say, half of the phosphorus that the plants would normally get, the plants and the microbes will do everything they can to find those nutrients in the soil. So even if you think that you're managing a system with low inputs and low yield, you're still resulting in that long-term depletion. And again, as just to continue uh, flagging that soil microbes cannot create nutrients except nitrogen, um, which can only be done under um, suitable, suitable soil conditions. And so because they mainly utilize what's there, the nutrients need to be replaced. <clears throat> the other key thing is soil pH. So we think about a lot of the Northeast Victoria, the expectation is that these soils are naturally acidic and so therefore we just deal with it. What we know now from a, hundred, a 100 year experiment that was done over at the Rutherland Research Institute when I was there, was that um, back in the early 1900s, the soils in our area were not, were not highly acidic. All the agricultural, um, some of them were, some of the really granitic soils are, but a lot of the soils actually start off being not too bad. But over the last 100 years of, of agricultural production, <coughs> um, every time we export nutrients from the system in our food and fibre, we also export alkali through our cations, calcium, magnesium, um, some sodium, potassium, etc. So we're, we're removing alkali from the system. So we then need to balance that export by replacing alkali with using lime or other alkali inputs to manage our pHs. So it's basically, the deal is um, to continue um, to consider to be farming sustainably, we need to replace the nutrients that we're exporting and we need to replace the alkali that we're exporting. If we're not doing that, then we're not farming sustainably. So as a and to manage our soil carbon, we need to optimise our water flow through our systems, we need to manage our nutrient levels, and we need to maintain our pHs, preferably above pH of calcium of 5.5. But in a lot of our soils, if we can get to 5.1, 5.2, that's fantastic. Um, maintaining those levels is what's important. And again, active management is required to build carbon. So some caveats and rule of thumbs, um, just reinforcing what we spoke about earlier. In terms of our soil specifics with soil carbon, sandy soils can hold less carbon than clay soils due to less surface area and less exchange capacity, which basically means there's less capacity for that carbon to be held in the soil by these chemical binding sites. Our low pH soils can retain less carbon and they have less microbial function. Crusted, dispersive or compacted soils, so soils with an existing issue, need to be ameliorated and that need to address those key limitations before focusing on soil carbon accrual. And each soil has a threshold carbon capacity. So we're not talking about an ongoing linear increase. So as we increase our soil carbon, our soil organic inputs through uh, biomass, through uh, amendments, through whichever way that you choose, um, we'll reach a point where our soil carbon percentages will, will flatten out. So the idea that you can continue to build and build and build is false. Different systems have a different capacity. In our systems, that capacity is, is reasonably limited compared to what's possible in our subtropical or tropical environments. It's just flagging that in those climatic conditions, because they've got warm, moist soils, they've got higher biological capacity. So 
So just manage your expectations. So work with what you've got and then create some really realistic um, goals to work towards. So this seems a bit of a no brainer, but where is the carbon in our systems? We tend to think about our above ground biomass as the key carbon that we're considering and what we're managing. What we forget is that there is just as much carbon in the below ground biomass in the root systems of our soils and then with all the fungal interactions and everything else. But even just considering the root systems of plants, when you think about it, that's the real powerhouse to build carbon in our systems. Because once it's in the soil as roots, as it's breaking down, there is by nature less likelihood and less capacity for loss. So sometimes I think we focus too much on what we can see rather than what's, what's below the ground. So when we think about our pasture systems and how we can manage and build our carbon in those systems, the key, first key is before we can think about carbon is to manage our pH in both our topsoil and our subsoil. So we're talking down to about 30 centimetres is where we need to be managing. The best case, or so the worst case, is even just to snapshot down to 30, because that's the zone where there's most of the root growth, there's most of the alkali export, and there's most chance of the development of acidity. So at least once in a while, measuring incrementally, 0, 10, 10, 20, 20, 30, will give you a good handle of your current status and give you an idea of what you need to be working towards in terms of amelioration. So in our pasture systems, we also need to be managing our nutrients, obviously. Ideally, we'd be looking at mixes of our perennial species, um, grasses, clovers and others. The idea being that perennial plants, because they're in situ for longer with less disturbance, they create bigger, more complex root systems, they go to depth. Uh, Phalaris plants, for example, have been shown to get down to at least three metres, which is a massive carbon bank when you consider that. Um, and the idea is, is you set the system up well and then you invest in, in a good perennial um, conditions and that's what will give you your big carbon gains over time. Just through setting it up well. If you're going towards a, an annual system of continual replenishment, then if you look at the energy and the short term nature of those plants, the, means that they're not going to <coughs> be able to, um, to generate the carbon that's possible in our perennial systems. If you're going to an annual system though, because of the environment and, your, and the system that you work in, the key to consider <coughs> is focus on your high quality species. General rule of thumb, if plants are good for agriculture, they're good for soils and they're good for carbon. So um, look at the composition of your pasture species. If you're talking about mostly onion grass and iridium, your capacity to build carbon in those systems is, is not much at all. If you're moving to the next point of, say, your, um, your short-term rye grasses and your, and your clovers or <coughs> whatever, that's, that's better. But ideally, if you can establish a good perennial species or a mix of species to get the diversity in root systems, that's where you're really going to make gains. Key as well, if you're focusing on um, focusing on carbon, you're probably also focused on productivity. In order to make those systems um, optimise, if you're looking to get most uh, profitable return, most productivity and gains for soil carbon, use your best practice methods, which have been around for you know, rotational grazing, etc. I think it's at least 15 or 20 years since that was demonstrated to be of value. So look at rotational grazing, look at cell grazing where it's appropriate to maximise your root growth and your biomass, which happens when you crash, when you've got large amounts of stock in a smaller area for a short time, you're removing that, that top and they're giving the plant lots of time to recover. And through that recovery phase, not only is it growing new, new shoots, it's also growing new root systems as well. And that role of rotational grazing and cell grazing, depending on the size, number of stock and the size of the areas, 
will also concentrate your areas of nutrient return so that um, animal feces are then returned into the, into the system. A, in more of a, a stable distribution rather than in stock camps where they normally are. In our cropping systems, this is harder because of the annual nature of our systems and the, the amount of disturbance that needs to happen. First thing we can do if we're in continuous cropping is to include a pulse in the system. The reason why that's so important is that pulses being legumes <coughs> have a uh, symbiotic relationship with certain rhizobia, which capture nitrogen from the air, which means that those plants basically act as your nitrogen capture mechanism to then support a lot of the nitrogen that you'll be able to access through the rest of the cropping cycle. If you can't grow a pulse in the system, <coughs> nine times out of 10, it's because your soil is too acidic. And that has to be then the key thing that you need to fix. If you don't fix your pHs and you can't grow your pulses, you can't capture your atmospheric nitrogen and you're stuck into a system of continual um, inputs. Where possible and when your systems allow it, a rotation into a pasture phase is the best thing you can do. Um, as long as those pasture phases are good quality pastures and they contain clovers, etc., which will fix that nitrogen. <coughs> that gives the soil a chance to recover. <coughs> Build soil organic matter because of that um, amount of nitrogen coming into the system, replenishes all your reserves of organic nitrogen, and that then provides a better supply of nitrogen in for the following crops. Other options to consider, um, and there's been a lot of interest in the last few years around intercropping or companion cropping options. So intercropping is where you sow, a, let's say, a sub clover or something down, down the tube with your wheat and then um, terminate that in spring before, before it starts to compete with the wheat too much to provide some, um, some diversity into the root zone of that system or companion crop options such as growing peas and canola together or something to again increase that diversity. But the challenge with diversity in our cropping systems is it exponentially increases the complexity of the systems that we're working with in terms of our weed control options and in terms of our nutrient and, and moisture uh, reserves and competition for those. So there's some starting to be some nice ideas coming through. Uh, we've got some long-term replicated trials in the region to, to look at these systems. Um, and we're trying to understand the relative values and the and the, the benefits and the, the negatives of having these. So there's been a lot of interest as well in summer cover cropping. This can be beneficial over summer um, through protecting the soil, providing a, a bit of a cooling effect. Um, in a lot of hay system, when crops are cut for hay, we tend to find that the, the crop reshoots and we, we tend to get a bit of cover over summer anyway. Um, but a, a, an intentional sowing of a summer cover crop uh, is something that is becoming of higher interest. The key with that is to really think about what your objectives are. Um, ideally, it has best value and be shown to be most profitable within a mixed farming system where you can actually graze that biomass. Um, but it's it's something to, um, to think about very carefully. Talk to those who are doing it and to see if it's something that, that would add value to your system or would increase the risk in your system. So Jim's going to talk about the use of amendments to build carbon. Um, from a, a baseline perspective, the addition of compost or other organic amendments will temporarily increase soil carbon. Obviously, you've got a carbon, high carbon source you're adding to the soil. Obviously, your numbers are going to go up. But the key with this is that it needs to be part of a strategic plan. So it needs to be part of something bigger or there needs to be a commitment to continue supply. So if you start, that means that you apply a, a manure or a compost or something to your system, then you can expect to, to maintain the benefits of having that. You can expect to have to continue to reapply. For example, um, in terms of a strategic plan, um, might be adding the amendments, then using them to stimulate greater plant growth or diversity 
which then will increase the buildup of carbon in the root zone. So it's, it's part, of a, part of something. If you're just applying a compost or a manure or something to the system, but you haven't changed anything else, that will soon be mineralized. So that carbon will be lost with most of the added carbon that you've applied converted to CO2. This is a term that's getting a quite a bit of use um, at the moment, stimulus packages. So if you're using these amendments as part of a stimulus package, that's when you can get your best bang for your buck. Otherwise, they can be a waste of time and money if they're not used smartly and you might be worse off than when you started. So it's really important to make sure that you're getting that, um, you're considering the whole system, not just, the, not just using them as like a band-aid or a quick fix. Just an example of the rate of mineralization or the rate of loss of carbon in these systems through CO2. This is just some work that we did years ago, which demonstrates that under, if we add a lot of compost to the soil, we add some compost to the soil, or we added lignite as a brown coal material to the soil. If we use CO2 respiration or microbial activity as a means of uh, determining the, um, the microbial reactiveness of those systems, we know that a massive amount of that, there's massive fluxes in CO2 evolution or, or microbes breathing when we're adding compost, which then connects with a whole lot of other data which demonstrates that a lot of that carbon can be lost if it's not used well. We talk about loss of carbon, uh, that can be done through soil loss, running down the system through inorganic nutrients, through inadequate nutrient supply, which results in increased release of nutrients from organic matter. If you're pulling out the nutrients from the organic matter, you're losing your structure, which means that you're losing your carbon as well poor resupply of carbon into the system, poor plant species selection or degraded pastures, and as always, acidification is our big deal. This is just flagging. We tend to work on the numbers a lot with carbon because that's our key measure, but it's not everything. So this is just demonstrating that the same two different soils could have the same total carbon one soil has a lot of particulate carbon, so that carbon that's used for nutrient cycling and soil health efficiency. And the other soil has a lot of humus carbon, so that's stable carbon, but not much nutrient cycling carbon. So it's just important that to consider the functionality of the carbon you've got in the system and what it's doing. So it's a bit hard to do, but just appreciate that the, num the numbers may not be increasing, but your management changes may be having impact through the ability to utilise the carbon that you've got in the system. And finally, how do you know if it's working? So if we're using GPS located sampling to track our soil carbon over time, if we're soil testing for nutrients and pH, we know that they're in, in ranges that are appropriate for our system. If we're observing our plant growth and our root growth, and that basically means dig a hole and have a look at the roots. If, you're, if you've got clovers or other legumes in your system and you dig up the roots and you can't find healthy nodules, little round things on your roots, then it's unlikely that they're functioning well. So that's a key indicator of how the system's going. <clears throat> Most more efficient soil systems will require less nitrogen uh, because everything is just working a lot more efficiently. That means that your nitrogen requirements for, for plant use may be going down. Worms are a key indicator. They're one of the first to, to bail out and jump ship when things go pot. So keep an eye on, you know, if, if you're finding that you're not finding the worms or you're finding more worms than you were previously, then that's a really nice um, support that you're doing the right thing. If, you're, if your goal towards building carbon is by planting trees and they're still growing, that's a pretty good indication that things are, things are going well. So, yeah, so just to, um, that's about it. And um, yeah, I hope that was of interest. And um, yeah, let me know if you've got any questions. Great, thanks. Great. Great. Um, my take home messages would be, make sure your ground cover all year round would be good with deep root systems. <laughs> Great.
Very good. Now, I've got one question from Joe. Is there much contribution to soil carbon from root exudates versus incorporation of plant matter by microbial activity? So the root exudates are quite a small contribution of carbon. Um, there's some plants that they can be up to say three, three or four percent of the total plant biomass. Things like white lupins, lup uh, lupus albus, um, are very efficient in that kind of thing. But pretty much the root exudate carbon is important for nutrient interactions and for supporting those microbes in the rhizosphere around the roots. So they're important from a functionality and a soil health and plant health perspective, but they don't have a contribution, they don't have much of a contribution towards total building soil carbon. And the other thing with them is that they're very small, simple carbon molecules that are broken down and, and decomposed by microbes really quickly, which means that they're, their half-life in soil is very short and very much instantaneous. But yeah, they're, 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 you wouldn't hang your hat on them to be a big part of your overall building soil organic matter. So there's no other question to this stage, but so to clarify, they do contribute, but only a small amount. Yeah, they're just part of the overall system. If you look at, so most plants, the exudation is in, can be up, you know, generally only about 0.5 to maybe 1% of the total carbon in the plant. So it's the plant material moving into the soil and it's decomposition by microbes, which are the key, key processes. Joe said, thank you. You answered his question. Any other questions that people would like to ask? Uh, just put it in the chat box, please, if you wouldn't mind, and I'll pass them on to Gas. Are there questions at this stage? Karen, sorry, not Karen? sure where the box is. Um, okay. but Sarah, that was excellent. But my understanding is that measuring that soil carbon through a reputable lab and that, we're still looking at uh, possibly 30 years to, sh to actually determine any serious difference from based on the Hamilton work. Is that, is that it right? So that's, so the Hamilton work was, was just about, well, as I understand it, Ron, um, was mostly around improving pastures f for accrual. Um, look at, it, it's the, the, the other thing, which, you, yeah, sorry, I'll start again. So the key, the key wins that you're going to get in the soil organic matter space are working with soils that are low in carbon at the moment. So that's where you're going to get that, that really significant change. And that's kind of where you can get some really easy wins around increasing pH equals and nutrients equals increasing plant growth equals increasing decomp, which means increasing microbes, increasing carbon. The Hamilton soil is historically reasonably high in soil organic matter um, with most of the soils down there you know having soil carbon measurements of greater than two um, some of them are, are even greater with high stores of organic nitrogen and everything as well so that means that you're already kind of on the top coming towards the top of your curve and you've got to work really hard to make any gains in that system. So in terms of the Hamilton systems, um, the, the best you could do is, is just maintaining that really strong root growth and ensuring that you're getting that cycling. And in those uh, pasture systems, cell grazing obviously may improve that as well. Um, in our systems in more northeast Victoria, we're quite away down that curve still. But what's really interesting um, I'll just take a moment with this, is that over the last two, three years, we've done some significant GPS located sampling through the region um, into northeast Victoria, into southern New South Wales. So we're talking, you know, 400 plus samples, mostly in cropping systems. What we're finding 
is that because we're doing GPS located sampling rather than the transect sampling that historically has been done, we're actually picking up these nuances in the system that we didn't really realize were there. So that just brings me back to another point that historically, and Ryan, this may actually follow why it's been so hard to demonstrate change in the Hamilton soils, is that the methods of sampling for those have been the transect or the bulking of samples across a paddock, mixing all that soil together, and then taking a small subsample of that for analysis. So what you're doing is you're diluting and averaging already across your system. And knowing how hard it is to measure that change, you've now basically shot yourself in the foot because you've, you've reduced your ability to baseline accurately, if that makes sense. So by with carbon, and this is the reason why the, um, the protocols for the carbon credits, et cetera, are all around strategic GPS located sampling, is that if we're sampling from a smaller area, we're getting our baseline from that area, which means that we can more sensitively capture any changes over time. Because, and then we say, okay, well, that's, that area may not be representative of the whole paddock, but we try and pick an area that is, and we may actually do two points, a high and a low, so a more set, a lighter, sandier part and a high rise and a, a clay flat or something. But once you've baselined in that soil, in that spot, then that gives you the chance to really start to show build on that. So I think that's a that's key. Okay, thank you for that, Cassandra. I've got one more question and then we'll start with um, me on to Jim. Uh, this question's from Joe. What about cutting hay to feed in your own farm, farm only? Does this return the matter to the soil or what portion is returned? The challenge with that is we're still exporting from the point which it came from. So at least you'll get benefit from it somewhere else in your farm in terms of feeding out and cows crapping and all that kind of stuff. But you're still exporting it from the point which it came from. So, so the other thing to think about is you're exporting that hay to another paddock, but then the stock that are feeding on that hay will be removed from your farm um, or they'll die like at some point. So we're still taking nutrients and alkali from that soil in that point and taking it somewhere else. So that's just something to think about. Now, the other thing, um, hay is actually one of the worst products in terms of export. In terms of it's it's the amount of lime required to offset the alkali taken from loose from hay, so loosened hay, for example, is one of the highest. And the amount of um, nutrients that are taken out as well, because you're taking the whole plant, not just the grain, for example, um, which you might be taking in cropping. So just, um, yeah, if you're if you're cutting for hay, then you need to keep a really strong eye on your nutrients and your pH conditions. Great, thank you very much. All right, Cass, I'll ask you to sign off now and we'll get Jim on board to, um, oh, Joe's also just made a comment, is silage better? Cass? No real difference. You're still taking the plant. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Cassandra. Uh, Jim, thank you very much for joining us today from sunny Horsham, is it? Uh, Neil. Neil, there you go. <laughs> so I'll pass it over to you and I'll log off. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, and thanks, Cassandra, for that wonderful invitation. Things are different. I've never given a presentation before from the comfort of a couch with a blanket over my knees um, <laughs> and in a motel room. So uh, thanks all for logging on. I will now try and share my screen. So just bear with me. Hopefully you can all see that. Yes, we can. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Um, so as I said before I start, thank you very much to Karen for inviting uh, me to present this webinar this morning and for your support of the project more generally. Um, and thanks Cassandra for that fantastic introduction that has saved me uh, a lot of trouble and you will have explained many of the things that I try and tackle in this presentation a lot more clearly than, than I've been able to. So thank you very much. Um, this project is funded uh, through DELP by the Virtual Centre for Climate Change Innovation. 
And so our focus is very much on ways to increase soil carbon and increase that carbon sequestration into the soil uh, that Cassandra was just talking about so well. And so in this project, we are looking at two methods, both of which Cassandra mentioned, uh, the application of recycled uh, organic compost and the implementation of a timed grazing or a rotational grazing regime, and trying to see if this can uh, set a framework up by which we might be able to uh, in improve soil carbon. So one of the best things about this project is this uh, title, I think, Dung and Dusted, uh, combining cows and compost to combat climate change and seeing if we can. So, how are we going? Oh, if I get on the thing, can I move it? There we go. Uh, the basic premise that we're operating on, I guess Andrew has just, as I said, has just explained beautifully. Um, basically, uh, if we improve the productivity of the system, we get more uh, shoot growth, more, pho more, pho more photosynthesis, we get improved plant root growth, uh, and therefore more organic matter or more organic uh, project yeah, or more organic matter into the soil uh, which through decomposition feeds the soil microbes increases their uptake of carbon and then when they die has that that so that carbon comes fixed in the soil uh, there is of course with this increase in microbial abundance uh, the uh, uh, one of the one of the um, uh, counter productions is the release of, of CO2 through respiration back into the atmosphere. So as Cass was saying, if we don't get that balance right, um, it can in fact, uh, it may not be a, a net benefit for soil, for carbon in the soil ultimately. But the premise that we're working on is by supercharging or stimulating or triggering uh, that improved productivity through the addition of compost and the implementation of a timed grazing regime, we do get that improved soil structure, carbon contact, improve the, the capacity of the soil to uh, absorb and infiltrate moisture and retain that moisture, leading to that increased primary productivity, increased microbial associations, increased decomposition of, of, of plant matter, and ultimately through to more improve, uh, more stored carbon. As I said, we're coming at this from a climate change perspective, um, and we're looking at dry land grazing systems. Uh, we've used just cattle grazing systems, but the, the uh, principles could work in any, any grazing pastures, presumably. Um, and I think looking at ways and whether we can mitigate climate change through increasing that soil carbon sequestration in pastures, as we know, it's the most common by area uh, agricultural practice uh, in, this, in Victoria and certainly more broadly in the country as well. So if there can be a method that can improve soil carbon at scale, uh, it could have a substantive uh, impact on, on our um, a capacity to mitigate climate change through carbon sequestration and also to a, a smaller extent uh, diverting uh, waste from landfill and potentially decreasing uh, synthetic fertilizer use may also reduce emissions uh, or, or, or at least greenhouse gas uh, emissions of, of the release of nitrous oxide that occurs through a lot of the synthetic fertilizer application. And on the flip side of that uh, trying to increase the resilience of some farming systems and therefore their capacity to adapt by, to climate change by uh, increasing soil quality, uh, physical properties to improve soil moisture and pasture quality, through, uh, particularly through dry times, uh, to perhaps enable uh, grazers to graze for a little bit longer into a dry spell or to maintain uh, good pasture growth through times of uh, climate variability or drier times. That's the overarching objectives. So how are we going about this and, and how are we going? So through this project, we've been able to trial, uh, well, yeah, we've set up trials on five farms, uh, three in the uh, Kyabram Stanhope district in the uh, sort of over here, central Victoria, one north of Bendigo and one west of Bendigo in Arnold. <coughs> on each of these five trial farms, we've implemented a, uh, a paddock scale trial in which we have the three grazing treatments represented here by the three different colours uh, being run at the paddock at a scale of about uh, three, uh, what's that, about 240 metres, sorry, about uh, 300 metres by about 80 metres each, each one of these uh, small cells. Uh, in the green is the uh, timed grazing that uh, our associate Lynn Kelson is, is managing and, and overseeing. So she's a, a, a holistic grazing consultant and, and overseeing that process. The maroon in the middle is actually a, a no grazing control for the, for the duration of the trial. 
and the MOVE is a continuation of business as usual. Uh, a couple of our farmers are already implementing um, some sort of rotational methods on their properties uh, and so are moving towards that pathway anyway. A couple of others are more in the set stocking regime. Um, but the time grazing is a more intense uh, crash grazing, if you like, uh, application of, of, of grazing um, than the, uh, the rotational grazing that some of the farmers are already using. And so cross against that, we have the application of compost here. Uh, so the compost is supplied by Biomix, uh, who located in, in Stanhope, and, and they are pre preparing, uh, sorry, pr providing a, a uh, recycled organic compost uh, soil amendment. Uh, admittedly, they normally uh, don't use, uh, don't uh, have many clients in, in pastoral systems. It's generally used in uh, cropping or uh, viticulture systems. Um, and we're applying that in three strips here, presented by these sort of black outline boxes across the grazing treatments. Um, we've had two applications, one of five tonnes per hectare in autumn and one of six tonnes, sorry, eight tonnes per hectare in uh, late spring last year, 2019. Um, so that effectively we have a trial on each of the five properties that has uh, each of the treatments of the three grazing treatments crossed with compost and no compost and replicated three times on each farm. And then we, we have taken a number of soil measurements, although I do note, Sandra, using essentially your transect method and the bulked up um, soil sampling that, that you're suggesting might have uh, decreased our, our sensitivity to, te to detect change a little bit. So what have we found? Not surprisingly, um, given the very short time frame of which we've been looking at this so far, um, which has just you know essentially been nine months, um, that we haven't seen a, a, any detectable change in the soil organic carbon measures as yet, um, or, and there's been no treatment effect. So I'll be showing a number of graphs that look like this. So I'll just explain this one in a little bit of detail. The different colors represent the different um, sampling dates. So the blue is our baseline before we applied any of the treatments. The orange here is after about, um, uh, about a month after the, ap the application of compost, the first compost application. The grey is just before the second compost application, um, some five or six months later, and the gold is about a month after that second compost application of eight tonnes per hectare. So that compost application is indicated by the, the black arrows in each in each graph. Uh, there hadn't been any grazing whatsoever in any of the treatments, to be honest, in these first two uh, sampling dates due to the very dry conditions that we were experiencing, as you recall, back in last. Uh, autumn or last summer and autumn, early winter, very different to this year. Um, so none of the none of the properties uh, had uh, grazing in the in the trial paddocks uh, at that stage. Um, but by the time of the second compost application treatment, they'd all been able to apply just one round of the of the timed grazing in the in the timed grazing cell and to uh, return stock to the business as usual cell. So if we're looking, for example, uh, just in terms of the setup of the of the design of the of the experiment, or the trial, um, if we're looking for the effect of compost in a timed regime, we're comparing this set of, of bars here with this set over here, um, and in the control here with here, and in the business as usual, this set of cells here and, and this set of cells here for the compost treatment. As you can see, there has not, you know, we've not detected any change uh, at this point, and. Uh, Following on from what Sandra was saying, you know, clearly it's not just the, the single application of compost in and of itself that we expected to do it if, uh, to make a change. It is in combination with the grazing and over time and continued management of these pastures. Um, also, thing to note is that uh, we saw this pattern essentially repeated across the five farms, but there was a significant variation between the farms in the in the uh, uh, the level of uh, soil organic carb carbon. Um, and again, so at the three farms down here, but uh, the uh, three over near Stanhope and, and um, Kyabram, and they have higher levels of base level of, of carbon of around about 3%, 3 to 4%, whereas the couple near the farms near Bendigo is closer to 1.5%, 2%, so much lower starting point. Uh, just that regional variation that Cassandra was talking about. But the same pattern was observed pretty much across the board. We looked at other nutrients and other um, elements in the soil. And again, um, 
uh, uh, at this point, you know, there, there hasn't been a strong signal or any signal at all really of uh, any change in any of these elements. And again, this is not surprising given the, the, given the time frame that we're looking at. Um, the other thing to note, of course, is there is substantial variation um, within uh, treatments on farms and indeed within within paddocks on farms and within cells and between uh, sites. So detecting that that signal across farms it becomes more difficult with that very high level of variation that we can sort of see in some of the, the treatments over here. So this is phosphorus um, and uh, no no signal detected there. And again, as Cassandra was saying, it's because you know we're not we're not creating these these nutrients in the system, but we are looking to see whether they, we can see a shift in their balance. And we looked when we looked at other elements, the nitrates, the nitrogens, for example, again, high levels of variability, but no signal of the treatments to this stage um, and potassium sulfur similarly. Now the measure, one of the other things we're looking at is, is soil moisture, uh, capacity to retain moisture in the soils. Um, we see a strong seasonal effect, not surprisingly, uh, but again, uh, basically no difference whatsoever between the treatments uh, at this point in time. So Lynn Kelson uh, has also looked at uh, some of those physical and uh, biological uh, indicators through a soil structure score, a composite score, uh, through digging the a hole and, and looking at the structure, the physical um, uh, attributes um, of the of the soil and things like the root depth and uh, its its flakiness and uh, presence of worms and what have you that some of which Cassandra mentioned before uh, to try and assess the structure and strength of the soil and we haven't got as many time slices for for this uh, measure just one pre-treatment and before the second application at this point uh, and again whilst we see a Improvement in the soil structure score generally across, you know, between the March and the October, I think it was sample, uh, probably re reflecting uh, the input of, of water over that time during the the, the rain that eventually came in in uh, spring last year. Uh, again, there's no signal of a treatment effect at this point in time. Lynn is also measuring bare ground and pasture. Uh, pasture cover, it's not a pasture quality or, or quantity amount, it's just a, a ground cover measure uh, in this top graph here. And so again, clearly and not surprisingly, a very strong signal of, of uh, between time sampling periods. And we're starting to detect perhaps a signal of uh, um, uh, compost and or grazing, but I must say we need to run the formal stats on this yet. I've just uh, collated the summary data at this point in time. Um, clearly there's a, 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 a more pasture in the, in the, I'm trying to find the cursor, there we go, more pasture in the treatments that have had uh, either no grazing, it's not surprising, no offtake, or, or the, and the timed grazing, so a reduced amount of time for which the pasture has been grazed at least compared to the control uh, sorry compared to the business as usual uh, grazing treatment there and there and there and there but considerable variation still uh, between the uh, within those treatments and not a strong signal at all of the addition of compost at this point if we looked at the amount of bare ground it's slightly more obvious um, and you know, of note is that basically before the second application, we saw virtually no bare ground in in the in the timed grazing treatments. None at all in the in the no grazing treatments. That's to be expected. But there's also no production benefit, of course, to be gained from not grazing your pastures. So that's not that's not a you know that's just a a comparative for this, the purposes of the experiment uh, compared to but much less bare ground compared to the business as usual. Uh, treatments and again, we're not really seeing any. If we compare this, this, these columns here or these ones here, uh, any real effect of the compost. We are also looking at the microbial communities. Uh, Sandra mentioned so Jen Wood, who's on on uh, on this. Uh, webinar and Howard Hapton and Ash Franks at, at La Trobe are, are helping with this aspect of it. Um, and so we're looking at both fungi 
richness, uh, diversity and composition, as well as bacterial uh, richness and composition. And uh, the richness is, is important, as, as um, Sandra mentioned, because you know with a with a more diverse and more diff, uh, greater diversity of fungal or bacterial species uh, in the soil, it's the probability that they'll be playing a, a greater range of functional roles, uh, increase the capacity to break down those different types of carbon, like Cassandra explained, and just generally um, contributing to a healthier and more fertile soil. Um, now again, these graphs are, are represented in the same way, except we have an, an additional time. Uh, um, sample here of basically one to two weeks. I think it, I think it was two weeks after the, the uh, first sampling, uh, first application of compost in the light blue. As mentioned, clearly significant variation in the number of fungal species in our soil samples over time, reflecting uh, uh, that temporal variation related to other elements such as, you know, uh, soil moisture, temperature, humidity, and those sorts of things, uh, and decreasing in the drier summer periods here, uh, as was mentioned. But significantly for the purposes of this, um, uh, this trial, we're not seeing at this point, again, any uh, strong signal of either the timed grazing regime or the uh, addition of the two applications of compost when we look at richness or when we look at in the bottom graph diversity and diversity differs from richness in that diversity is a measure of uh, I suppose the uh, evenness or the relative abundance of uh, different species in the sample so you don't want necessarily want lots of different uh, you know high richness high number of species in your sample but being dominated by just one or two uh, of those species you want, you know, try aiming for or a higher diversity would be represented by a more even distribution of the abundance of those species within the sample. So something again to be aimed for to try and get that balance. However, when we start to look at uh, fungi composition, so this is the relative uh, abundance of the and the and the and the types of species that are there. The previous graphs were just looking at a raw number of species. Well, the first thing to note is that we get a very strong uh, site effect. So the different colours, just a quick representation of what these graphs mean. Spots on the graph that are closer together have a more similar composition of species, fungal species in this instance. Spots that are further away are very different to each other. So we click in the pretreatment uh, date here, we see a very clear aggregation of the different sites, indicating that essentially each of the farms has their own unique signature of the, the, the fungi composition. And this is the compost itself up here, which is very different again. I took some samples of the compost itself. After the uh, application of the first compost, that site treatment, uh, that site effect, difference between sites is still stilly there, still there, but it is diluted a little bit as there's a, a little bit more of a, uh, uh, the, the compost is adding a, 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 a homogenization effect, if you like, um, of amongst the sites. They're, they're less distinct at their site level, at the farm level. Likewise, after one month, that's more diluted. Before the compost, six months later, the farms, the different sites are separated back out again to their their natural levels, if you like, and then uh, that is maintained actually after the second compost. And that's sort of of interest, it's, but really that, all that's telling us is that they're very different uh, composition between farms, and that's not to be, that's to be expected, nothing surprising. When we look at it by treatment, we can see that in this first one in March, it's a bit hard to tell because the colours haven't been applied quite as well, but basically, we can still see the site groupings here, but the different treatments are completely mixed together. There's essentially no difference in this, the species composition at the baseline before we'd added any of the treatments of the composition, which is what we want to see. Um, now, in these following graphs, the blue symbols are those that uh, were not treated with compost and the red symbols were those that were treated with compost. So one week, uh, sorry, two weeks after the first treatment of, comp of compost, application of compost, we're still seeing a pretty much a mix of 
the species, there's no treatment effect. Likewise, after the, one month after the first application. But a few months later, we're starting to see uh, some separation of, of treatment sites based on whether the compost was added or not. And then after the uh, second application, there's still some signal there, but it's very much again back into the uh, into the uh, the site groupings. But even within the site groupings, we are starting to see separation of the of the compost treatments and the non compost treatments. It just in terms of the composition. If we look at bacteria. It's a very similar story. I won't go through the richness stuff. That's the same. Uh, again, these compositional graphs. Um, highly distinct sites early on. One month after the first application of compost. Uh, this is the one I really wanted to talk about. This is the, the separation of the sites uh, by compost treatment or no compost treatment. So that we can see down here by December, we're starting to see a clear separation of the bacterial communities. In those, those cells that have had compost added versus those that don't. So this is consistent across the different sites. There's still clearly differences between sites, between farms if you like, but we are starting to see an effect of the compost on the composition of the, of the microbes that are present in that soil. So what's next? What does this mean? The, the key thing is what does this mean uh, in terms of the function that those groups are performing in the soil. So that will be the focus of our next sort of um, piece of work is to look at this functional group analysis to, to look at the composition of the microbes that are that are separating out into those different uh, groups within the, the soil that have had the compost added and those that haven't, and to look at some of those elements that Cassandra was talking about, uh, but also some others that what which uh, microbes either fungi or bacteria contributing to the formation of soil crusts, um, to breaking down the carbohydrates, denitrifying, um, which ones are potentially pathogenic, which ones are tolerant to stress and freezing and desiccation and the like. We'll also take another sample. We ha had planned to take a, a, another sample in April, but we've had that COVID delayed um, and we will do that um, in the coming months. Uh, look at some more depth in some of our formal statistical analysis and undertake the, um, as I said, the functional group analysis. Our hope, obviously, this is a, we have this, this current project only has a relatively short time frame. And in some respects, the delay through COVID has actually been beneficial because we're actually extending it. And, and so we can get a slightly longer time slice. But as has been mentioned already, we need longer. So we are hoping that the farmers involved, and I'd like to thank them all very much for their, their participation in this uh, trial. A couple of them have registered to be online today. I'm not sure if you're there, um, but thank you if you are. Um, we're hoping that they'll continue with the grazing, uh, grazing treatments and that we might be able to um, also have further compost applications to look at the impacts of these uh, in longer term and we can maintain uh, we can repeat the soil sampling and look at uh, the effects uh, over a longer temporal scale, which is clearly important. Mm. So thanks for that. I think I've probably gone a little bit longer than hoped. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll finish there with acknowledging uh, many people that are helping this project. Uh, as I mentioned, Karen, but also Vanessa and Ian from Biomix, uh, Jeffrey and Aaron from DELP, who are um, uh, supporting the project through the, the uh, Virtual Centre for Climate Change Innovation and our five farmers there. Great, thank you very much. Oh, give us feedback. All right, All right. we have a question for you. Hang on, I'll just get off. Um, yes. I'll just get off sharing my screen. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, Jim, we have a question from Ron. Jim is for rotational break. Sorry, Karen, you're breaking up there. I didn't get that. I'll have a look at the chat myself and see. Yeah. Uh, where was it? At the top, Jim is BAU set stocking on rotational grazing. Uh, so it's it's sorry, it's it varies between the farms, but it's it's um so the business is usually set stocking in um in three of the farms and 
a longer, I might call longer phase rotational grazing in a couple of the others. So it's not uh, very short, intense periods of grazing as we're uh, as we're applying in our timed grazing um, cell. Uh, it's a it's a longer, generally a longer duration, but certainly a, a rotation. Question from Alison. Yeah. Yep. Um, unfortunately, the we only have uh, funding for one more uh, monitoring round, Alison, um, uh, which, as I said, was planned to be in April, but will now probably be this this spring. Um, um, and we don't have uh, plans for another application of compost at this stage, um, but we would love to be able to do that. Um, both for the trial itself, if we could extend the trial, and and for uh, the farmers. Are you measuring Olsen phosphorus as well as Colwell? Um, no, we're not. Uh, I think the 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 so we're on the the measure that we have through the lab that we are using is only providing us with with uh, Colwell phosphorus. I think I could check. I might check on that and get that. But my, to my knowledge, it's just the the Colwell. Sandra has asked. Uh, a monitoring changes in pasture composition over time. Uh, yeah, look, that's a that's a a, a good question. Um, we are so when Lynn does the pasture measures, um, she's also we, we're also taking a a um, uh, that's done on a transect, and there's a there's a uh, the species of pasture is is recorded. Um, again, the time the time duration of this trial is sort of limiting to what we would expect to see over that, um, and we have a high amount of variability in the pastures that are present uh, at any any given site. But yes, we are monitoring that. That is in the monitoring design, um, but it's it's and I haven't looked at that data as yet to be honest. But I wouldn't have expected any change. Um, uh, at this point, and to be honest, the first sample that we took in March, there was no pasture in the in the in the, in the paddocks. They were, they were basically almost bare. Uh, you know, there was a little bit uh, here and there, but there wasn't much. It was so dry. Uh, another question from What is the quality of the compost, and would the results be representative compost in general, or of this particular product? I can't answer that because I'm not a compost expert, to be honest. Um, I presume there is variability in composts. And, well, no, I presume there is differences in compost and different compost products. So, you know, in the true sense of a of a, uh, a, a scientist, that yes, the the results of this trial will be uh, particular to this product. Um, and I suppose another research project will be to compare the the uh, composition. Of compost from different makers, different um, uh, yeah, from different sources to compare their their uh, microbial uh, composition, I suppose, and and to see if there's any difference. So, I would limit my conclusions to this particular product, um, but I suspect that there might be uh, some generality across composts in in general. But uh, yeah, uh, without we're not doing a trial of different composts, which was really what we would need to do. Um, uh, to, to answer that question in detail. Next one, are you measuring any production in pasture and animal? Not in animal, we don't have the resources to do that, unfortunately. Um, we are measuring pasture in terms of just pasture cover, uh, and we will take, we'll take some pasture samples for some quality and quantity measures. Um, the next sampling run, unfortunately, that's sort of um, uh, beforehand. Uh, sorry that we didn't, haven't got that beforehand, A, because there wasn't any pasture the first time, um, but we'll be able to do a, a, a post hoc one at the end of it, um, but not any animal measurements. We just didn't have the, the resources to run to that. Two more questions. One. Was the compost tested? Uh, yes, it was. We tested it before um, the uh, before the application. Um, all of the compost that we used across all of the farms was from the same um, batch, if you like, from from Biomix. So it, it was the same product applied at each of the farms. Um, basically, one one of the windrows there, one one uh, batch of, of compost was was applied uh, and used in um, 
in each of the farms. So uh, we have that information on on the quality, and and they you know Biomix themselves test their compost regularly, uh, you know for their their compliance and their certification. They need to do that. They have full organic certification of their of their compost. Um, so in terms of that side of things, that's they they do that as part of their their process. We have sampled it for um, the microbial and the biological aspects. And in terms of the design, yeah, it was the same compost that was applied across each of the each of the um, uh, each of the farms. And one last question, um, If you, <laughs> we, we we we'll be well. Keep 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 in touch with Karen. Would be a good start. Um, we'll be hopefully towards you know we now have a little bit longer to work on this thanks to COVID um, so we'll be producing some you know fact sheets and flies and things like that that, that summarize the results of the study um, we hope to um, you know perhaps run a, a field day on one of the farms if we can um, and also through our website uh, at the research um, center for future landscapes at Latrobe um, we don't we've just got this study in its design phase at, at the moment but we'll be putting results and, and links to conclusions um, and reports and the like up on that. Um, but yeah, we'll, we are fully intend to produce a, a, a plain language uh, statement of the outcomes of, of this study, um, probably in about 12 months time. Very good. Thank you. We might leave it there for that day. Thank you for those of us who have attended. I do have a message here saying really enjoyed the workshop. Um, yeah, I'd love to see the video. So. We'll keep you posted about the video when that's posted on the CMA website. Um, an evaluation form will be posted out to you from Eamon Reeves at the CMA. Um, the evaluation sheets are very important for us so we can run free events. This all is fed back to the Commonwealth, not with your details, of course, um, but the information is very important for us. Um, and we'll be sending out the presentations, thanks to Jim and Cassandra. Today, they've allowed for us to uh, use their presentations for extra information for you and that'll be sent to you shortly um, along with some other further reading that Cassandra has suggested around soil carbon. Um, we had also another, Greg has said an excellent session, thank you very much in, um, all involved bring it together. So thank you very much everybody for uh, attending and uh, if the uh, presenters could stay online please we'll just do a bit of a debrief um, and we'll say goodbye.